the literary technique of allusion. So an allusion is a brief reference or indirect reference to a person, place, thing, or idea of historical, cultural, literary, or political significance. It's just a passing comment where the writer expects a reader to possess enough knowledge to spot the allusion. Some examples, don't act like a Romeo in front of her. Romeo is an allusion to Romeo and Juliet by Shakespeare and is suggesting that he's a lovesick, heart, heartsick romantic. The rise in poverty will unlock the Pandora's box of crimes. So that's a reference to Greek myth mythology and Pandora's box being opened and unleashing lots and lots of bad and evil things. And in the last example, this place is like a Garden of Eden. And this allusion is to the Garden of Eden in the Bible, uh, where it was beautiful and wonderful and perfect before the fall of man. So Steinbeck uses allusions, both direct and indirect. Here's some direct allusions. Then he picked up a pulp magazine from the shelf. You can see up in the right-hand corner, there's a couple of examples of pulp magazines. The allusion to those is a bit difficult for us today because we haven't seen those magazines if we don't know what they are, but they actually are short stories. They don't actually have a lot of pictures. The second one down, the hell I ain't got a luger. It won't hurt him none at all. That's a reference to a gun, a pistol used by the Germans in World War II. And if you didn't actually know what a luger was, you wouldn't be able to picture what that gun looks like. In uh, the last example, I've knew people that if they got a rag rug on the floor and a Cupid doll lamp on the phonograph, they think they're running a parlor house. And in this example, there's actually three illusions. Um, rag rug, it's made out of rags and it's woven into a rug. Cupid doll lamp, which is the picture in the middle. It's got a toy doll attached to the lamp base. And a phonograph, an old, one of the old original record players. There are also indirect illusions and in, in this particular novel, the title of the book is an indirect allusion to a poem by Robert Burns called To a Mouse. He was an 18th century, uh, it was written in 18th century Scots English, so it's a little bit of a tough poem to read. The entire poem is about a nest of a field mouse that Burns, a farmer, overturned when plowing a field. And this is just actually the last stanza here. But mousy, thou art no thy lane, in proving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes, O oh, mice and men, gang after glee, and lee us not but grief and pain for promised joy. So in this last stanza, the farmer is, is talking to the mouse and saying, you know, that in the first stanza, thou art no thy lane, your choice, your idea to put your, your nest in this lane. Improving foresight may be vain. That was a bad idea. You didn't really think ahead putting it in my field. And then he compares the mouse to men as well and says the best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glee, meaning go awry, don't always go the way they should, and leave us not but grief and pain. And those, even our best ideas, our best dreams, sometimes leave us grief and pain rather than the promised joy we had hoped. And as you continue to read this book, think about how this story about the mouse putting his nest in the farmer's field, um, how that wasn't such a good idea. And sometimes our dreams of home and ideas that we create don't always turn out the way we want. And so how does that, what happens with George and Lenny and their dream of having their own farm someday? So the literary technique of illusion, authors often make references to things and if a reader is really aware, they can make the connections and understand them. And sometimes if they aren't familiar, one would have to look them up to make those connections.